Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I think let me just thank the Mining and Daba for again coordinating an excellent event and for again affording us the opportunity to address you at this forum. For those of you who are unacquainted with core consultants, we are a focused mining consultancy offering bespoke research and analysis and outlooks for a number of commodities, including bulk, base, and minor metals. With respect to our service offerings, we provide consultancy services, including pre-feasibility and feasibility studies, market entry studies, and valuations. We also assist mining and engineering companies in complying with their ISO 9001 standards and offer a number of subscriptions, including ferrochrome and rare earths. In keeping with the same structure as the previous two years, I have chosen three metals from the minor metal or ferro alloy space, which we believe are necessary for the continuation of our modern way of life. Furthermore, these metals are commodities which we have studied over the course of last year during various feasibility studies and are therefore interesting in the African context as they have each attracted substantial investment. We will provide a high-level overview of the specific market dynamics affecting the phosphate, mineral sands and chromium industries. So let's start with the phosphate market. With respect to phosphate reserves, 65% of global phosphate reserves are held in Morocco and West Saharan region. Accordingly, Morocco accounts for around 40% of the globe's traded phosphate rock. Interestingly, unlike most of its commodities, China actually has sufficient capacity to, pr to actually satisfy its requirements, though India is virtually wholly reliant on imports. A consideration of phosphate projects due to come online indicates that the market is expected to be less strained than in previous years. Over $9 billion has been invested into phosphate exploration and development over the last 18 months, which is helping to alleviate market pressure. In terms of advanced projects, there are around 40 new MAP DAP expansion projects, mostly in China, that are due to come on stream over the next five years. Additionally, around 5 million tons of phosphoric acid is expected to be added over this time. By 2014, the International Fertilizer Association forecasts that global phosphate rock will increase by 20% to 228 million tons from the present 190 million tons or so. All regions, with the exception of the U.S., are expected to exhibit an increase in production capacity, though the U.S. is predicted to decline as the quality of remaining ores are, have been declining steadily. Near term, despite upcoming projects, we expect that phosphoric acid capacity rem to remain constrained, especially given the strength of the global recovery in fertilizer demand. The net addition to merchant-grade acid capacity is expected to be only 1.3 million tonnes, most of which will come from Jordan, Morocco or Tunisia. Over the medium term, global phosphoric acid capacity could reach around 55.5 million tonnes by 2014, with additions expected to come from China, Morocco and Saudi Arabia. However, in the case of China, the grades are fairly poor and they are unlikely to export any of this output. On the demand side, the IFA forecasts 3 to 5 percent growth in phosphoric acid demand through to 2015. Developed regions such as North America and Europe are expected to rebound and account for around 15 percent of global phosphate consumption. Incidentally, the reason that um, Europe and, and America actually have a proportionately lower amount of uh, phosphate consumption is that um, during the year the soils remain fairly uh, well fertilized and therefore they only really need to be fertilized along harvest seasons. Unlike in the emerging markets where the quality of soils are generally nutrient deficient and they need around 75% more of phosphate in order to get the required yields. China and India are the main phosphate players and together are accountable for almost half of the globe's phosphate fertilizer consumption. The difference between the two countries is that China has vast resources while India barely has any. Both are populous nations with increasing standards of living which necessitates more advanced farming techniques and better quality soil. Food represents a threat to both these nations. In China, the government is targeting improvement in agricultural productivity by increasing farmer subsidies, transferring land use rights, and increasing the minimum price of any key commodity. 
In India, the second largest fertilizer consuming country in the world, food inflation is a serious threat and government has reacted by promoting balanced fertilizer applications to ensure maximum yields and banning the incremental use of food-based cooking oils for biodiesel production. China consumes around 12 million tons, almost all of which is produced domestically, while India's finished phosphate capacity in the form of MAP or DAP is fairly significant. It must import the majority of its raw, of its raw materials, including phosphate rock and phosphoric acid. While China is able to satisfy its domestic requirements, it does not have much to spare for exports, and accordingly Morocco is responsible for exporting around 40% of the globe's requirements. In terms of industry structure, the world's largest producers of phosphoric acid are mostly government-owned, with publicly traded companies controlling no more than a fifth of the phosphoric acid market. The Moroccan government, under the auspices of OCP, has a 49% share of the phosphoric acid market. This situation represents a risk to supply as resource nationalism could become an issue, especially as the global reserve life is less than 100 years based on current consumption levels. We therefore believe that phosphate rock will increasingly be viewed as a strategic resource over the next couple of decades. We are already seeing protectionism of rock and downstream products, and China, for instance, has placed a 110% export tax on phosphate-based fertilizers. Overall, if we look at the supply-demand curve, we believe that phosphate rock is facing a structural deficit. This means that whilst there is sufficient supply on the global scale, the rock is not being traded efficiently, resulting in some countries having a relative oversupply while others suffer with supply constraints. That being said, phosphoric rock is a non-renewable resource um, and based on current mining rates has less than a 100-year reserve life. To date, there is no replacement for phosphate in fertilizers, and we therefore assert that the, this market represents growth and investment opportunities. If we look at the mineral sands market, we believe that this is one of the most impressive commodity sectors, currently buoyed by secular demand growth for both zircon tiles and um, titanium dioxide, which is generally found in coatings and plastics. And even though the growth in China has slowed, urbanization in both China and India is expected to continue and drive growth in these markets. Moreover, growth in demand comes at a time of significant underinvestment in the sector, which has left a void of new projects, and it is one of the few sectors currently which is characterized by undersupply. Within the global se sector, Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the key growth sectors boasting three major projects, namely the Kuala project in Kenya, Momo Mine in Mozambique, and Grande Cote project in Senegal. Collectively, over the next three years, these projects expect to add around 2.3 million tons of ilmenite, which will more than double the current ilmenite supply, 209,000 tons of zircon, which will represent a 17% increase on the 2012 production levels, and 162,000 tons of rutile, which is expected to increase uh, product 2012 production levels by 22%. Mineral Sands incorporates two core product streams, namely the titanium minerals and zircon. Titanium minerals are generally far more prevalent in mineral sand ore bodies than zircon. Other products, such as rare earth minerals um, or monazite, and iron ore minerals, which are generally found in the form of hematite, could be found also in the mineral sand deposit, and in some cases they can even be extracted economically. We consider the supply of titanium, zircon, and ilmenite, which comprise the main components of a typical mineral sand body. So looking at the titanium minerals, this feedstock is relatively consolidated, with the top five producers accounting for over 50% of global supply. Australia is the largest producer, followed by South Africa and Sierra Leone. Zircon is even more consolidated than titanium, with the top five producers supplying three-quarters of the zircon market. Australia, again, is the largest market, followed by South Africa. Going forward, sub-Saharan Africa will be of increasing importance once these projects reach full production. New supply opportunities are relatively hard to come by as the industry underinvested under in development owing to years of lackluster prices. 
There are a number of brownfield projects which are close to production, and a few projects which were previously um, were uneconomic are now viable and are in advanced stages of either feasibility or early developmental stages. On the demand side, mineral sands industry over the past 25 years has been characterized by stable yet unexciting demand growth trends. Mineral sands is largely a construction project, as I mentioned, and until recent years, with the high rate of suburbanization com coming from China and India, the mineral sands demand was dominated by mature economies, and hence growth rates were low at around 1 to 3 percent per annum. The majority of titanium feedstocks finds its way into titanium pigment industry, with paints and plastics its major end-use sector. If we consider the pigment industry, we note the following key trends. Asia accounts for 45% of the global pigment consumption market. China is both the largest pigment producer and consumer and produces around 8 million tons per annum. The largest end user industry for high performance pigment is the architectural paints industry and volumes for this industry is set to rise by 4.1% compounded annually until 2018. In Zircon, the industry is expected to deliver um, a similar demand trend to the titanium industry. 53% of Zircon goes into ceramics, and 89% of this is used in tiles. In terms of the expected growth rate in ceramic tiles, this is expected to increase from the present 8 billion square meters to 11 billion square meters by 2020. Taking into account the upcoming projects as well as future demand trends, we then estimate the supply and demand balance curve for titanium feedstocks and zircon. Large-scale underinvestment as well as a strong secular demand has resulted in a significant supply and demand gap. We forecast a shortage of around 200,000 tons of ilmenite this year. Persistent shortages are expected unless investors start developing new projects in earnest. In the case of Rutal, we expect this to be even tighter than Ilmenite, as the market is expected to be in shortage by 280,000 tonnes this year. If we take into account the number of upcoming projects, this gap is expected to only widen to 400,000 tonnes by 2020. Zircon as well is expected to be characterised by a deficit market over the coming years. We therefore would expect that the mineral sands industry will offer significant returns and opportunities to investors. Finally, before I end, I'd just like to touch briefly on the chrome ore market. There's a lot of research um, on the state of the South African ferrochrome industry, but comparably little is said on the, on the state of the chrome ore industry. Having completed a recent market study on chrome ore on behalf of a major upcoming producer, I would like to take the opportunity to share some of these insights with you. In terms of supply, the International Chromium Development Association estimates that the world chromite mineral reserves and resources total 3.6 billion and 7.5 billion tonnes respectively. The most intensive mining occurs in the South Africa's Bushveld complex, which boasts the most extensive chromite reserves and resources in the world. In terms of reserves, it consists of about 3.1 billion tonnes and resources at 5.5 billion tonnes. The country has over 90, 90 producers and sufficient mineral resources to sustain an estimated 200 years of mining at current production rates. In order to evaluate the potential supply of chrome ore, we considered all known chrome ore mining projects, including the chrome delivered by the South African UG2 platinum producers. Globally, we expect the chrome ore production will rise 2% compounded annually um, to 2020 to around 34.6 million tonnes. With respect to South African chrome ore production, to determine the exact production is challenging as the industry is highly fragmented, characterised by very low barriers to entry. In recent years, this has caused an unknown number of fly-by-night operations, which we refer to as the Bucky Brigade, which, although small, is sufficient to upset the market balance. South Africa produces around 12.5 million tonnes of ore per year from independent LG6 and integrated ferrochrome producers and accounts for around um, a quarter I say, of production and 40% of global exports. An additional 3 to 5 million tonnes is supplied by the UG2 platinum producers. 
In order to estimate the level of chrome ore demand, we consider the ferrochrome production levels and use the relationship that approximately two tons of chrome ore is required to produce a ton of ferrochrome. As with chrome ore supply, we considered all known ferrochrome capacity expansions and new projects, and based on this information, we estimate that the ferrochrome production will rise from the current 7.8 million tonnes in 2012 to 13.17 million tonnes by 2020. This implies a chrome ore demand of 26.34 million tonnes, which results in a surplus of chrome ore when against the 34 million tonnes of supply. While this fact alone should result in poor prices, that is such an oversupplied market, we note one important thing, namely that the rest of the world cannot fulfill the demand without utilizing at least 10 to 12 million tons of South African ore. If we now consider the cost of South African chrome ore productions on a per mine basis, we show that in order to achieve at least 10 to 12 million tons, the price floor of the South African ore has to be around 800 to 850 rand a ton X mine, and we therefore have faith in the long-term prospects of the chrome ore industry. So just to end off, I would like to summarize the points made earlier today. In phosphate, we believe that the prospects for this market are sound and that the industry represents huge opportunity for African countries to develop their phosphate resources as phosphate rock is expected to be in deficit. Similarly, for mineral sands, both the titanium feedstocks and zirconium is expected to face shortages by the continued urbanization of populous nations such as China and India. And finally, on the chrome ore side, the market is facing a surplus. However, the cost of production has increased, and in order for the market to be in balance, the minimum price, of, in our opinion, should be around 800 to 850 rand per ton X mine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Doesn't look like any. Thank you. Ah, sorry. Um, if you, I, I would say up 20% in the case of titanium. And um, in the case of zircon, probably a bit less, up, up about 15% over the next um, four years.